Hey guys, before we dive into this episode, I want to mention show sponsor Public Goods. Now you've probably heard me talking about them before, but it's because I only work with brands that I actually like and use, and Public Goods is one of them. They've done so well in stocking their online store with sustainable, clean products from shampoo to razors to muesli that you keep in your pantry, and my boys love the muesli. And so when you buy things online, it's important to know where they come from. It's important to know that what you're putting in and on your body is clean. This is 2021. Toxicity is not an option. We need to do our homework when it comes to the products we put in and on our bodies. Um, And of course, because they are a sponsor of the show, you know you're going to get a good deal. If you go to publicgoods.com forward slash unstressed, you get $15 off your first purchase and there's no minimum order. So go to publicgoods.com forward slash unstressed and get your $15 today. This episode is also brought to you by Motherhood Unstressed CBD. This is my line of organic USA grown hemp that was specifically designed to help you, the listener, battle stress and anxiety on a physical level. And what I think most people don't understand is CBD is not going to get you high. Yes, it comes from the hemp plant. The hemp plant looks exceedingly similar to the marijuana plant, but it doesn't have high levels of THC, which is the molecule that does create a psychoactive effect. CBD isn't going to get you there if that's what you were desiring, sorry, but it is going to help balance your endocannabinoid system, which is an overarching system that controls every other aspect of your body. So we're talking about sleep, your stress response, how happy you feel, your dopamine levels, all of those things. So if you are interested in feeling better and feeling less stressed, then head on over to motherhoodunstressed.com, click the shop tab, and use the code podcast to save 20%. Pamela Druckerman is the author of five books, including one of my favorites, Bringing Up Bebe, which has been translated into 30 languages and optioned as a feature film starring Anne Hathaway. In this episode, we talk about her new children's book, Paris by Phone, which details one little girl's pursuit of the magic of independence and her subsequent realization of the true meaning of home. We also get into the history of French cultural influence on America and other countries and why we all admire and hope to embody the certain je ne sais quoi of Parisian motherhood, womanhood, and life. And I loved this conversation. I've admired her for years. I read her book when Nash was first born. He's my oldest. He's almost nine now. So to speak with her, it was such a full circle moment. And to be able to ask her, you know, what is it about French women that we all hope to embody? What is that magic that they all seem to have? And so I think you're going to love that. And I think by the end, you might feel a little magic, some little creativity within yourself. So please enjoy my episode. If you love it, please share it with a friend. And of course, love it when you share it on your social media stories on IG. And tag me at Motherhood Unstressed when you do, and I'll share it back out. And then we really are creating this community of women all over the world who listen to the show, who are into creating a beautiful life for themselves. And it brings us all together. Merci. Et à bientôt. Bonjour, Pamela. Bienvenue. Welcome to the show. I'm so glad that you're here. Thank you so much for having me on. Yeah, absolutely. I have been a fervent reader of your work for many, many years, especially when I was having my two boys. Um, it really touched my heart bringing up baby. So thank you for that. Um, but, you know, just to jump right in, writers are such observers of the world around them. Did anything happen in your life that sparked the the idea for this new book, Paris by Phone? Well, the truth is that they came to me. Um, Penguin came to me and asked me, based on bringing up the day, if I would want to write a children's book. But um, it was one of those things that I immediately, instantly knew that I wanted to do. Mm-hmm. And I instantly knew that I wanted it to be a rhyming children's book because I love rhyme and I love writing rhymes. I'm the person who like for your birthday will write like a 20 stanza uh, mm-hmm. song to the tune of New York, New York about your whole life from the time you were like two years old. And um, I just, I'm not saying I'm any good at it, but I love doing it. So it was just such a welcome challenge. But then the, the shape that the book took and what it was about had all kinds of inspirations too. Yeah. Did anything surprise you when you were writing it? Like I was, I'm going to go in this direction for this is the story. And then you kind of just changed it. Um, well, I guess the interesting thing about writing a children's book and I worked with an illustrator is that the pictures bring so much dimension to it. 
So um, there were a lot of lines in the book that I ended up cutting because mm-hmm. it was like they were said, it, it got redundant because you could see what was happening in the picture. I didn't have to mm-hmm. describe it. But I knew I wanted to write a book about the fact that kids are in a way, in good and bad ways, sort of trapped in their families. That can be really frustrating at times. Even if you have great parents, they're limited. Um, they impose rules. And I wanted to write it from the perspective of a kid saying, I'm out of here. <laughs> I'm leaving and I'm going to a better place. And I thought, what's the better place that people always dream of going to? The sort of plan B country imaginary land and it's Paris. Yeah. So I thought, what if there's a little girl who's mad at her mom and says, I'm going to go to Paris and find a better family. <laughs> and I thought, well, how, like, how does anyone get out of their house? Like, how do you, how do you escape now from And I thought, oh, it's your phone. Like the phone is the way out. Mm -hmm. So, and the mother was in my story was always staring at her phone and always having deadlines. Like I have all the time because I'm Mm -hmm. a journalist. And so I realized like she would have this magic phone that could take her to Paris. I love that. And again, it is like this, this idealized place for all of us, especially Americans. It is such an American in Paris tale. Why do you think Americans and really the world are so enamored with Parisian culture, French culture at large? Why are we, we always obsessed with it for years? Yeah, it's true that people all over the world are obsessed with Paris. You know, there was this Russian movie that kind of inspired my book too, called A Window to Paris where these um, Russians in the 1990s living in some like dismal communal Soviet style apartment find this trap door that opens onto Parisian rooftops and they Mm -hmm. all kind of escape to Paris, which is the opposite of their lives. So, but I think for Americans, it's a really good point. It just has this very special place for us in our imagination. And it always has, I think because it's, it's quite far away for us. You know, if you're in In Britain, you can take a train here from anywhere in Europe. You can be in Paris in a couple hours. But for Americans, it's a really big, expensive trip. You might only go once in your life on your honeymoon, if at all. Um, So it started from the from the beginning that of the time that America was a country to be the kind of opposite of America, this place where Americans went to become sophisticated, to um, to think about art and to consider, you know, the way things look to be very important. Um, They have different sexual norms and that always fascinated Americans because we come from this, you know, quote unquote, pure tradition. So France is kind of um, different enough to be really exotic and interesting and compelling um, and on many levels kind of like fascinating to peel off the layers and see what's underneath. But on the other hand, it's safe. You know, uh, France was our first ally. We've still never been at war with France. Uh, so we can mock them, we can tease them, but it's all done within this kind of safety zone. So I think that's, um, from, and from the very start, you had people like Benjamin Franklin going to uh, Paris, even before America was a country, and writing home about like, oh, they wear these amazing clothes, and he starts wearing There's new orgies. <laughs> right. No, he actually said, like, I was very nearly making love to my friend's wife. <laughs> So uh, it's this place that we play with, we mock. It's very much a love-hate relationship. So I wanted to to funnel all those, I kind all that whole mood into the book. Yeah, and I, I and when it's so funny that you said Benjamin Franklin because that's who I was thinking of when you go back to the beginning of this country. I remember you know his writings talking about it. He spent so many years in Paris, you know, when he was still running things and being active in you know American culture here. Like he was always in Paris because it was such a great time. And I Thank think you. that that has Thomas to Jefferson too. Yes, yes. So. And honestly, like I chose to study abroad in France because I think of that idealism that I had. And then I got there and I was like, yes, this this is everything that everyone's been saying is true because you get there and it is like, it's more relaxed and you can enjoy and you can, you know, experience pleasure and all of those things are so valued in the culture. Uh So you weren't disappointed. You didn't have a kind of negative culture shock. No, no. I mean, I think the only negative was that I was a poor college student. That was it. (laughs) Everything else was a dream. I think it was the ultimate freedom. And, you know, you would go to a bar and you wouldn't get smashed, but you would have political discussions. You would talk to your friends about important things of the day. And I think that that's something that American culture is lacking a little bit in the in the younger generation. Mm-hmm. Well, I would argue that we talk about politics a little bit too much now. Well, this, year, this has been a year. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, but now, I, you know, going back to the book, it, it was such a, a beautiful tale. And I love the line. I wrote it down. 
when uh, the little girl said, Paris is perfect. I hate it to part, but home is the place they know you by heart. And it made me think, well, where is Pamela's heart? Where do you, where do you call home in your heart? I mean, I don't mean to be, I'm being honest, not sappy, but I, my children were born here. Um, and I, you know, I live here with my husband. I mean, I live with my family here in Paris. And I think, um, for that reason, I think here is home, but I would say it's more, it's more about the people, um, that I live with and my, my friends around me, um, than the place per se. I don't think the thing about Paris is it, it's, it's, it's like a beautiful woman who won't talk to you. Um, <laughs> so I, I don't know if I could consider that woman home exactly, but somehow in the midst of all that, I've, I've made a home, but my, um, entire biological extended family lives in the U S mm. so, uh, you know, obviously I have a very strong connection still to America and I, in normal times I went back as often as I could. Yeah. Yeah. How has it been, you know, quarantining in Europe versus here? I, I feel like we get a lot of stories from the media and things like that. How has it actually been this past year? Um, I think in some ways it's been very similar to the way it's been in the U S and that people have just really stayed home a lot. Um, there was a sense in, um, in Europe, definitely. I mean, it's changed a little bit recently because we've been having big problems with the distribution of vaccines you may have heard, but mm -hmm. there was a sense that the government was, um, uh, fact-based, uh, science-based, and was kind of taking the right steps that we could to protect the population as much as possible. I mean, obviously, they made mistakes, and there were plenty of little details to disagree with. But the general orientation, it felt like there was somebody, somebody of goodwill and yeah. uh, intelligence in charge. And I, and um, what I felt about America, what I observed, and what I heard from people is just the sense of of chaos, and that mm -hmm. um, you know people were dying without. Uh, without the government really taking, the federal government at least, really taking steps to stop it. So uh, hopefully that has all um, taken a turn for the for the better right now. Yeah. Um, but in terms of what it's like to be, to be in Paris, just on like a day-to-day -day level, it's been uh, in some ways, I mean, I hate to say this because this is amid a lot of tragedy and I'm very aware of that and people who've been working through the whole pandemic, but it's been a really inc incredibly intimate time to be, um, in, in France, uh, during the first lockdown here, which was in March and April, I, for the first time I heard no, no one else speaking English on the streets. I felt incredibly conspicuous um, because there were no tourists, mm -hmm. there were no cars and we were allowed out for an hour each day. And the only, pretty much the only activity we were allowed, physical activity we could do was walk or run. So everyone became a jogger suddenly. <laughs> there were no cars. So we're all just like running like ants all over across <laughs> bridges and all over the city. And it was suddenly, um, I realized that so many things that I had considered like part of Paris in quotes, but not part of my Paris were actually really close to me. Like I could run to the Seine in 10 minutes mm. and I could run back and as, especially as I got in better shape and I could run further, I'd run back and forth over the bridges. It was like, they were mm. mine. It was like this little doll city that suddenly belonged to me. So that was, that's been really beautiful. I love that. And I, I mean, I remember, do, do people, do women especially wear shorts when they run now? Because when I was there, every woman wore pants and I was like, well, this is, this is a thing. This is different than America. You mean while they were jogging? Working or? out. Yeah. In summer, people wear shorts, but now it's it's freezing outside. Right. Here, so, <laughs> uh, no, I, I wear I wear leggings. I don't wear I don't wear shorts. <laughs> but I'm a little bit older than you, so oh that please explains it. No, and I love that though, like because I think such a big part of French culture too is like going to the market every day and like um, really having a strong connection to your immediate community. Like here you have to get in the car and drive to the big grocery store and it's a big, you know, supermarché. Whereas you have these more, you know, s specific places. You could butcher for your meat, the baker for your bread and all of that. Did that exist before the pandemic for you or did that increase as you really kind of hunkered down? Well, I mean, I hate to be a buzzkill about the idea of going to outdoor markets and the butcher every day, but Honestly, I go. I spend a lot of. I, I often go to the supermarket. They have wonderful produce, but it is true that it's much more like a, a city like New York, for example, mm -hmm. um, in that it's a walking city. Like I walk. I, I I pull what in America is considered like an old lady cart, but here <laughs> everyone pulls these little trolleys. You bring them to the supermarket, you fill it up, and then 
unpack it at the register. And that part of um, really urban life, which you can get in lots of cities, but which mm-hmm. is very much a part of Paris is, is here. What has happened in Paris is that deliver, food delivery used to be um, the exception and mm-hmm. now it's becoming more and more the rule, both getting gro- ordering groceries online and having them delivered. And also, I mean, for years when I lived here, you couldn't just call somebody up and order Thai food and have it in right. your house an hour later. Uh, that was one of the things I have to say I miss most about living in the U.S., <laughs> was especially in New York. Like, there just wasn't, like, it wasn't so e- – there was, like, one, um, uh, uh, like, incredible Thai restaurant with a huge line out front. And so – but now they have Deliveroo, and the, the city has changed in that respect. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, you know, you could say it's it's not for the better, but from the perspective of a former New Yorker, it's definitely an improvement, especially yeah. during the pandemic. <laughs> Right. And a working mother. I mean, you're, you're very busy. Like those things are clutch, especially for, you know, every mother who is home with her children, you know, doing school during work. What, what would your advice be for the woman listening to this who wants to feel a little more Parisian, a little more effortless, <laughs> you know, like all of you beautiful French women out there and what can we do to bring a little more French culture to our homes? Um, well, I think, uh, you know, if we, we could talk about it on a sort of policy level. There's a lot in America that would structurally make things more, quote unquote, Parisian or European, um, you know, like paid maternity leave, mm-hmm. uh, child care, help with child care. Um, you know, in America, like famously, you don't get any help from the government till your kid goes to kindergarten or maybe pre-K. And in France, there's a um, there's subsidized child care for from almost the very beginning. Um, And there's paid maternity leave. Um, There's a national, um, there's free preschool from the the year that your kid churns three years old. And there's 100% participation in that pretty much, or 99%. So that really enormously structurally makes a difference for mothers working or not. I mean, it's, it's, you know, we, we talk a lot about quote unquote family values in America and um, we don't put that much muscle behind it. Um, Why do you think that is? That's a really good question. Um, and it's a, it's, a, it's a deep question. I think um, uh, one answer is that um, we associate, we're allergic to anything that sounds like quote unquote socialism. I don't know why I keep saying quote unquote socialism. <laughs> or, or, it's a, just this verbal tick that I've developed today. Um, uh, socialism or communism and there was communal childcare in the Soviet Union. And so when um, we tried in the seventies to have a system like the French creche where there would be you know, universal daycare or Um, government subsidized daycare like the U.S. military has by the way right um uh it was it was shot down because it was um I was about to say quote unquote again socialist Mm -hmm. and there's that same conversation around health care and so Mm -hmm. we're um there's this dogma in America that's developed over the the last few decades uh against big government and this idea that the government can't do things well or that the government is not responsible shouldn't be responsible for these things when in fact, in the rest of the world, the rest of the, the wealthy world, it is. So you just don't have people in Europe falling through the cracks like they're falling through the cracks in the U.S., tragically. Yeah. I think that's um, such a beautiful way of putting it. No, please continue. No, but that's, that's, a, that's on a, answering your question on a structural level. And there's, you know, there are hours of conversations to be had about why that is and where that comes from. But I think it's really just too bad that... Uh, we can't get past labels and look, because pre- if you ask, if you survey Americans on whether they want everyone to have health care, they will all say yes. Yes. Yeah. I mean, and I think, you know, even reading Bringing Up Baby, like when I read about the crash and and everything that was was available to the mothers, my heart sank a little bit because I knew that by the time my children were in elementary school, you know, that still wouldn't be a reality. And even the moms, you know, coming up behind me, they still don't have that. And, and you've got two parents working their butts off, trying to just pay for daycare and the mortgage and everything else. And it is like, Man, if we could get that right, I think it would change. It would change America. Yeah. It would change the rest of the world. 
What's really nice is that for years, I think American mothers blame themselves for not having it all, not being able to manage everything, for being so stressed out by the demands yeah. of childcare plus work um, plus everything else. And now there's a more structural conversation happening about um, the forces in the, the the missing elements of uh, the missing policy elements, things like crash or maternal, the, the, the free um, preschool that are missing from America and that it's not our fault. Amer- it's not the fault of mothers that they can't hold it all together. It's that there's just simply not enough support. Yes. And I had Olga Mecking. She's an author of a new book called Nixon on the show a few weeks back. She loves your work, by the way. So this is like a, a weird con- uh, connection moment. But she talked about this too. She talked about the systems in place uh, that really dictate the stress levels of the mothers you know, wherever they may live. And it's so true. And then you just said that too. And I think it's it's so on point. And I think it really, anyone listening to this can can let that, that burden, that guilt, that stress off of their shoulders. It's not my fault necessarily. Yes, I still need to work and be a mother, but I don't need to blame myself for feeling like I'm struggling because the system in place is already stacked against me, you know, or, or for me, wherever you may live. Yeah. And the thing that, I mean, this is something that's not a policy argument or critique, but it's really just um, a kind of cultural habit, which is American moms are um, kind of expected to feel guilty and to think that they're not doing a good enough job as moms, Um, not for anything particular, uh, just because there's always more that you can be doing. Just what we do. It's fun. Yeah. <laughs> We're good at it. It's free. Why not? And I think we we validate guilt. You know, we think that if you feel guilty, it's proof that you're doing a good job. Yeah. Way, it's like a tax. You, I don't know. And yeah. If you're too happy, then you must not be caring enough. Yes. Um, and in France, that guilt is not validated. Um, I mean, there is there are mothers who feel guilty, but it's not sort of proof that you're doing that you're doing everything right if you feel very guilty it's sort of proof like that you're wasting your time on um beating yourself up when you could be enjoying a glass of merlot yeah yeah do you feel like the like the community of women in france is is more open to talking about these things is more open to talking about struggles or you know or their happiness levels or you know maybe the affair that they're having or you know <laughs> Things like that, because I do want to talk about your amazing book about you know, relationships and extramarital affairs in France and how it's looked at there versus here, because I find that so fascinating. But do you oh. think that the community of mothers there versus here is more open and supportive? Or is it just, again, going back to the system in place that we're all in uh-huh. dealing with? Well, just just to make a point for the record, people do not talk about their affairs here. They're <laughs> oh, extremely okay. discreet. Okay. They want them to continue. <laughs> and they know if they talk about them, we're just going to get out. They're very good at, the French are very good at keeping secrets. Mm. Yeah. But is it more of a respect thing to keep it discreet and to keep, you know, or is it, I just want this to continue? It's, I want this to continue. It's, um, this is a part of my life. Um, I'm talking the, I'm using the internal dialogue of a French woman, like that's just for me. Yes. Um, that's not to be shared with anyone else and to share it would in a way be to ruin it. And also it's a guilt thing too, because they don't um, typically feel bad about it. So they don't have to purge their guilt by kind of confessing, which I think happens um, maybe in the U.S. Yes, there is an obsession with laying it all on the table, being vulnerable, being completely authentic in America that I've noticed. And I don't know if that's necessarily a good thing or if it's just another way to to be accepted, you know, if, if we think that that's the, the route to being accepted, what are your thoughts on that? Um, I think there's a huge difference between America and France, between um, the way we think about honesty and transparency, especially in marriage, which is very relevant to, to what we're talking about today. Um, the American idea is um, you should tell your spouse everything, or at least everything they're willing to listen to. And the more uh, open a marriage is, the healthier it is. And the reason why something like an affair is so terrible is not necessarily because of the sex, it's because of the lying. Mm-hmm. And if you have like a, it creates like a blockage in your marriage and nothing will be okay until you confess. And, um, in, you know, in American marital therapy for an affair, often the person who cheated will tell the their spouse everything that happened, all the details that the spouse wants to hear. And the idea is that that, the strange idea is that that's healing. And the French are... Um, 
think that's nuts. <laughs> <laughs> they, they go to their graves without ever, their spouse ever finding out that they had a love affair on the side or that they, they, they don't actually cheat more in France. That's also really important to know. I love that you just said that. <laughs> um, but they just handle it differently. They think it's fine to have secrets from your spouse. In fact, that it, secrets can be sexy. And they, they believe in this idea of the secret garden where um, you have this private realm where you do things, where you know your own mind and you know what you need and you get that. And uh, it's a kind of personal freedom um, that they think makes your life more exciting, even makes you a better partner in your yeah. relationship, your core relationship. Yeah, I was reading something the other day that said, you know, we hardly know ourselves fully. You never fully know your partner. You never fully know this other person. No matter how much you think you do, we're all changing day by day, minute by minute. And so to to have that secret garden, to have your own internal environment where you're exploring and connecting with yourself, I think is is a big gift. You know, not that you have to go have affairs or anything, but just that you have <laughs> you're not that, recommending this. I'm really not, listener. I'm sorry if it if you think that <laughs> listener slash husband in the next room. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I wish he listened to the show. Um, <laughs> um, but no, it's it's true to have your own quiet internal space where you can really just explore and connect. I think, you know, especially for you as a writer, I'm sure you have a just a beautiful garden. I have a rich secret garden that, um, no, I'm just kidding. No, I mean, I have a, you know, a, a quite mundane life, especially now. I wish it was more exciting, but um uh, I do uh, get, I would say, inspiration from these French ideas. But once, when you grow up in America, as I did, um, I, I also feel that I'm kind of formatted with American ideas and assumptions and values. And um, I have these French moments, but somehow I seem to bounce back into my American self. Yeah, the programming um, is strong. Yeah, it's, it's powerful the way you're formatted by your culture um, even if you, even when you get some perspective on it and yeah. live, you know, I've now lived, um, in France as long as I lived or longer than I lived in Miami growing up. That's where I grew, grew up. Mm-hmm. Um, and yet some part of me, if you woke me up in the middle of the night, would just think I was like in my room in Miami, you know, where I was all those years ago. It's yeah. Like your young protagonist in the, in the book. Oh my God. But, yes. Yes. <gasps> Interesting. Deep. Um, Well, speaking of you having a boring life, which I completely disagree with, congratulations on bringing up baby being uh, brought as a major feature film featuring Anne Hathaway, or there's talks about it. I feel like it's pretty sure. I don't know if we can talk about this. (laughs) No, it's brewing. I hope it's, I really hope it's going to happen. That's so exciting. Congratulations. Thanks. I mean, fingers crossed. This is Hollywood. Anything can happen, but it would be wonderful. She's amazing. She is. And hopefully they'll film in Atlanta, you know, if California is still closed down. So we are the Holly, we are the Hollywood of the South in case you didn't know. Okay. Are you the Paris of the South though? Uh, no, no, I guess they would have to film there. <laughs> well, there's, some, <laughs> there's some good sets here. Um, but, uh, Atlanta I, is beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. But that's, that's so exciting. How does it feel? I mean, obviously the work it resonated with me. It's resonated with so many other women. It's going after this film to resonate with even more. How does that feel to know that something that you put out into the world is going to touch so many women? Um, it's been, this book has been an incredible journey for me because when I wrote it, I was really an unknown writer and I was astonished by what I was learning when I was writing the book. I mean, I was so excited about the material but I had no idea whether it would resonate with anyone else. Mm. And I discovered once it came out that not only were Americans kind of struggling with the issues I described in the book, issues about about guilt, about the pressure to spend more and more time with your kids, to be hyper-involved, but that um, people in many countries, that this was a global problem, uh, phenomenon, this kind of hyperparenting pressure. And, uh, you know, I've, now I've been to like Ukraine and Brazil and, you know, I've talked to people from all over the world, to parents from all over the world. And uh, they're all describing with some, you know, local variations, um, problems around that same theme, the pressure to mm. be a sort of perfect mother. And France continues to represent um an alternative to that, 
a viable yeah. alternative to that. Yeah, it's really, I think, a champion of the mother rather than the child. But the child benefits in the process. <laughs> it's win-win. It's all perfect. It is. It is. So, no, it's not, Of course, there are problems here, too. I mean, it's not, things aren't perfect. And things aren't perfect in Paris, despite what I wrote in my children's book yeah. um, in, in, in Paris by phone. But there are, it is in many ways, um, a kind of mirror image of the American model and so it's instructive, I think, even though the French are perfect, to look at what they do to get perspective on our own assumptions and what we think is normal. Yeah, yeah. And again, even if it just lets one woman be a little easier, give herself a little more grace, I think that that's important. Is that what you want your work? What is it? What is the impact that you would like your work to leave with the world? I would like to make people laugh. <laughs> I mean, I, I wrote, a. it's a self-help book in many ways. But mm-hmm. it's also a memoir with a beginning, middle, and end. It's a story. And um, I was as much interested in the um, self-help, in the story part of it as I was in the self-help part of it. Um, and I've, uh, I've kept going from there. I mean, I've written, um, uh, my last book, it was called There Are No Grown-Ups, was about turning 40 and what that, which you will, not relevant to you at all. No, um, please. Yes. <laughs> But um, but was about it was a memoir about getting older and entering a new phase of life and being called Madame instead of Mademoiselle, and what, all the little things that that triggers and, mm-hmm. and, and what that what that experience is like. So I guess um, I write very much from my own experience. Arguably too much. My husband would say too much. Mm-hmm. Um, I do also write about other people sometimes too, and I interview people a lot as well. But I think I, I hope that by um, as you said at the start, like being an observer and hopefully um, a caref- careful observer and an honest observer that I can tell stories that resonate for other people. Yeah. And you just have this knack of picking the exact right word for what you're trying to express. And I think that must be the hardest thing for any writer to, to really get skilled at. I would say my view is that writing is rewriting and um, all first drafts are terrible and everything that I've put out into the world, I have, if I have the time, and certainly in a book form, I've rewritten 20 times, 20 mm, times. Wow. It's recognizable from the first draft. So I would say to any budding writers out there, don't worry if what you first see on the page is, you know, makes you feel terrible. Because <laughs> that's what first drafts are like. And you mm. just have to keep going and keep polishing it and make it better. Have you ever written anything where you're like, that's good? I'm just going to leave. Like, that's good. That's exactly what I wanted to say. If I thought that for half a second, the next day I would realize it was too <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I love it. Okay. So to round out everything that we've talked about today, this has been a wide ranging conversation, I must say. Um, with everything that you have learned in life, what is something that you want the listener, the woman listening to this to walk away with? Well, for women with small children who are listening to this, I would say, it gets better. (laughs) Um, The early years are really challenging and stressful and, um, but uh, it's an amazing process. And the older your kids get, the more uh, interesting it gets. It's less about manual labor and more about conversations and, Mm. um, and, and really the relationship. So I would say hang in there. Hang in there. I love it. Pamela Druckerman, thank you so much for coming on the show. Where can our audience find you online and get the book? Ah, Um, you can go to my website. It's on my website. It's PamelaDruckerman.com. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Merci beaucoup. Merci à toi. You've been listening to the Motherhood Unstressed podcast, and I'm your host, Liz Carlisle. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'm so grateful that we got this time together today. And if you love this episode, I would so appreciate it if you would share it out on your social media and make sure to tag us at Motherhood Unstressed. Connect with us at Motherhood Unstressed. I'd love to connect with you uh, and see where the work has gone in the world. And make sure that you subscribe so that you never miss out on an amazing interview with an incredible guest or our weekly guided meditations every Wednesday. Till next time, see ya.